One of the editors I used to work with he used to tell me that he liked my images because he could taste the place. Welcome to Photography Life. I'm John Sherman, and that was delicious. Lick your chops, because today we're talking with Jack Dakinga, legendary landscape photographer and Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist. Jack's impressive career has spanned over half a century, from shooting for the Chicago Tribune and Chicago Sun-Times, to contributing to Arizona Highways and National Geographic. In 1971, Dakinga was awarded photojournalism's highest honor, the Pulitzer Prize for Feature Photography for his story on abysmal conditions at state mental hospitals. Dakinga has 10 books to his credit, the latest being Capture the Magic. It's this book with its sublime photos and educational text that inspired me to head to Tucson and seek an audience with the legend. Dakinga was sharp, funny, down to earth, opinionated, and impassioned. Please join us as Jack tells us about his photography life. I would say that my influences in landscape photography were not landscape photographers. It came from photojournalism. So uh, the, the overriding theme in all my work is telling a story. So, so and that would be journalism and documenting a scene and sort of honoring the subject and then portraying it in a compelling way so that somebody can understand it and, uh, and be, you know, driven to look at it, basically, and hear the message. I've had a very fortunate life in that I've had a chance to work with and around some of the best in the business. But, you know, I might, there was a guy named Larry, you know, a guy who doesn't get much credit, Larry Burroughs was a Life Magazine photographer who shot some of the best Vietnam footage and, and, and stills um, and, and had just tons of Life Magazine covers over the years. But I, I, I would put Larry Burroughs really high on my list. I mean, I, and I, I had a kind of an eclectic group of people that I liked. I liked Yusuf Karsh for his portraits. You know, I liked Ansel Adams because of, you know, he sort of started me thinking about near and far and large format. You know, like Eugene Richards, I mean Eugene Smith, mm -hmm. uh, for his uh, Minamata Mercury Poison uh, piece. And uh, probably of all the people you were, you know, going back to people that influenced you, Philip Hyde was a friend, and uh, I guess he was Ansel Adams' first uh, student in San Francisco, and then he and Ansel produced the format series of Sierra Club books, which of course made a bunch of national monuments and parks. But so Phil and I became, he's the closest thing to a mentor that I had in landscape. And, uh, and I read about Philip uh, back when I was in Chicago as a photojournalist about this man's lifestyle of going out and documenting wild places and, and then making a difference. So, you know, that was a profound thing for me because I was already a sizable fish in a sizable pond, but I had to leave all that to come in and be born again as a landscape photographer. I should back up a little bit further because before I got started photographing for the newspapers, I did publicity photographs at O'Hare Airport of celebrities. And that was large format. It was you know, basically a speed graphic or a, or a my, you know, two and a quarter. So then I went to the newspapers and it became 35 millimeters. So, um, you know, they're just different tools you use to do the job basically. And so the overarching theme is the way you think, and, and I always have thought sort of spatially and a near to far. I mean, near to far is like a cliche that that people attribute to certain photographers, and I, and I just think it's just it's one of the things you do. I mean, you got a wide angle lens, you're gonna have near to far, right? You know, it's, you know, telephoto lens, you're gonna compact it, and uh, so so um, I think when I went from shooting journalism to large format, I was not fully formed as far as what I wanted to be. And what large format does is it teaches you to slow down, to be very deliberate in compositions and to really use, utilize the, uh, the canvas in front of you. So you're much more aware of corners and flow, texture, 
how light creates form and how that creates a composition. So it only took me 50 years of doing this to figure it out, but uh, but what happens is that you know they're all components to, to making you who you are. Well, lots of friends of mine have done the same thing or tried to do the same thing, and they had a really hard time going from one genre to another, be, maybe because I am dyslexic. Um, when I looked at an image upside down and backwards, it looked great. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, I could compose much better that way. I first initially, you know, initially thought about you know, doing stitches versus a single exposure on a 4x5. Well, it turns out most of the 4x5 exposures were in excess of 10 seconds. 6 to 10 seconds, and sometimes 15, 20, 30 seconds. I mean, I made minute exposures, two minutes uh, for a geographic shot. Um, but uh, once I kind of put that together in my head, I just thought, you know, I can, I can use a tilt shift lens and, and shift across the same plane, an optical plane, with five verticals and make a 4x5 horizontal in less time than it would take me to shoot a 4x5. The great thing about the Nikon um, in general is it it's more photographer friendly. It has a lot of manual things like mirror lock, and, you know, I mean, with other cameras you have to go through a menu to get to it. But uh, you already hit on some of the big things, but live view is incredibly important for what, for what I do. Split screen, live view, focusing is about the best thing I've, that's ever been invented because then you can do a near to far simultaneously check on your focus. Magnify mm -hmm. near and far with that split screen. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing a, a you know, a, a, a stitch pan over um, with a shift, you know, I'm just going to do the near to far so they're both sharp, stop it down and, and, and blaze away. I mean, it, to me, photography has never been easier. The other thing I started doing, I started using uh, Sigma art lenses. Mm -hmm. This whole art series lenses, right. which are all 1.4, and they're extremely sharp. Because one of the things you find out is that the newer cameras, like the, the D10, um, the, the Canon, uh, whether they're top of line 50 megapixel, mm -hmm. um, they exceed the carrying capacity of the sensors, mm -hmm. of, the, of the lenses, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. The sensor exceeds what the, what the lens can provide. And um, so um, you start seeing all the warts in some of your older lenses. You know, some of them just look like not so good. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's, 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 it's a lot of techni technological mishmash that is not at all the reason I got into photography, but you sort of have to know it. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate. I mean, I feel, I feel like I need to take a shower after I learn all this stuff. <laughs> but it's, but it's, uh, I mean, it, 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 it is daunting. And I mean, a lot of people gave up and they just didn't, didn't want to, you know, it wasn't worth it to keep going. But, you know, sometimes I'm sort of fascinated by it. And some of the stuff I really like, there's also a lot of really, really, really bad things. And the, the worst of the worst is that the, uh, it seems like the discipline of photography is kind of taking it uh, in the shorts. There's no, there's no set formula, I mean, it's, uh, my, my, my attitude is that the best photographs I ever take are the easiest ones. It's like when I, I'm walking along and it just knocks me over. It happens very rarely, but it does happen. And, but most of the time I'll see something and it'll be the wrong time of day or something's not quite right. And, um, you know, a photographer's not much unless he's an obsessive compulsive, so I'm pretty obsessive. So I'll come back, you know, do it at the right time. But uh, most of the time, you know, it's, it's the second or third pass. And then I'm have to go back different seasons, different years. I mean, I just, uh, I'm pretty boring, you know. It's, it's, um, I typically start off looking at intimate details and then looking at doing the what if, you know, lining it up against a grand landscape. 
with the idea that if the weather does break and I get what I want or something spectacular, I'm going to be ready to go. Another analogy, it's like a relationship. You can have a one night stand or you can get to know somebody. And uh, so to me, um, to really understand uh, an ecosystem, for instance, or a, a biome, you really need to be there at different times to see what's going on. And uh, I think, like I said, you have this relationship, then you can better tell the story of a sometimes a pretty complex ecosystem. easy they're in a hurry <laughs> they can't uh, they can't slow down and it's uh, you know it's sort of a product of our culture and, you know that's you know you, 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 you know that's one of the beauties of as you were saying you have a tripod which is in a sense bolting you to the ground you know using a live view as a way to see the whole palette or in the end the canvas in front of you and you can uh, be a little bit more deliberate in, in, in composition. And uh, the nice thing about landscape, as opposed to wildlife or any kind of you know people action shots, is that it, it's more contemplative. But what happens is that because it is a computer and it can go fast, people want to go fast. It's a landscape in front of you and it's going to be very deliberately composed. And you're going to watch all the lines and how they interact with the corner and the rule of thirds and all kinds of, you know, stuff that really makes it a composition and then waiting for the light to really paint it or the color of the light. Um, that sort of contemplative approach and the patience to do that is something that uh, not everybody has and most people struggle with. This is the only easy question you ask me. You take an orange and you hold up the orange and you walk around it. That's it. You can, you know, you can enlarge that and, and talk about the color temperature and that's when it gets a little bit more nuanced. But basically, uh, light creates form and that's, you know, that's it. That's the whole enchilada. Yeah, I call it volume. And it's just sort of like the, you know, the volume of, you know, it's like we're talking about it, you can whisper with the photograph or, or screen. But uh, the more contrast the light, the more you're screaming, the more rich the blacks are, the more like exclamation marks. There's all kinds of analogies to writing. And, uh, uh, you know, like a tight sentence is, is what you strive for. Same thing with a photograph. it's art you know let them express themselves well <laughs> if you're any kind of an artist you knew that there was a foundation of, of learning art the basics first and having that foundation knowing what's you know what you can do and then you can splurge and, and get crazy and, when, and every time they, they ratchet up the uh, the saturation or the black point or something to make it you know more gonzo color you keep saying oh it looks better and better and then when you're done you look at it You've got Frankenstein, and, and, and it has to do with you know what's your intent for the photograph. If you're if you're trying to nail somebody's eye in a magazine, flipping through pages to show them an advertisement, then you might want Gonzo. But then sometimes your voice may be more of a whisper than a shout, and I think photography can you know, pretty much decide uh, the, the the level of volume that you want to transmit a message with. I see photographers all the time uh, taking photographs instead of making photographs. And I also see people, um, they'll say they saw a photograph, but they won't know who the photographer was. And it, that's inconceivable to me. I mean, when I, you know, when I was starting off, I knew everybody's byline. Well, you know, I mean, I have a contemporary, you know, I've always been a fan of Carl Clifton's work. Patricio Robleskill, Franz Lanting, Daniel Beltras, George Steinmetz. And what you're seeing here is a group of photographers that I feel are doing substantial work. Committed environmentalists first. They happen to make really compelling images. And, and to me, that's, 
I mean, it's, it's, photography is really hollow unless there's a purpose. A, photor a photograph needs a reason for being. A lot of people do the bam, bam, thank you, ma'am kind of shots. You know, they just kind of another roadside attraction. I, I would not encourage anybody to be a, become a photographer. Um, as you said, you know, the, the number one thing, I mean, there's lots of 30 plus year, you know, 30 year olds that, that are really confirmed environmentalists, and, but they can't make a living because they're up against doctors and lawyers who will spend $3,000 to make a $10 photo sale. The, the problem with photography now, or it's always been the problem, is that it's, it's a perfect medium for copying. It's, you know, basically you're a copy, copy machine with, uh, with legs. So, you know, the, the, I guess the, the best way, the best advice is to resist that and try to, you know, to find your own path. You know, I've got a, I've got a bunch of bucket lists now. I mean, it's, uh, at this point in my life, they're called the fuck it lists. Ah, uh, fuck it. So, um, but I want to go back to Baja. I mean, Baja to me is incredibly special. So, and I want to go north. You know, so I want to you know, point the truck north until I run into water and point the truck south until I run into water and see what happens in between. To me, it's not about a place, it's about the sense of discovery. And I guess maybe I'm just a big kid, but I'm always curious and I'm always wondering what's around the corner. You know, when I first came out to Arizona, I mean, when I looked at a map of Arizona, you know, I basically was fixated on this area between Ajo and uh, Yuma, the Cabeza Prieta. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a gigantic roadless mass in the middle of a pretty populated state. So I had to go there. It's gotten a lot more intense since my surgery. You know, I cry at the drop of a hat now. I mean, it's like, I get really choked up by stuff, you know I mean? My first day back when I drove into, uh, from Escalante to Boulder over that Hell's Backbone, I, I thought, I, you know, I just started crying. But I mean, it was like such a rebirth experience for me. It was cathartic. I mean, I was like, I'm getting choked up talking about it now. But I mean, it's a, uh, so many, so many, you know, great places I've been to. And been, you know, so fortunate. So, what a great job. Uh, Cooper's hog just went right by there. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably some guy in India wants me to tell me that I have a problem with my PC. Okay, talk. Can yeah. I show you a Chicago trick? No sweat. I know. You is what you is. If you've got diarrhea of the mouth, you know, nobody's going to listen to you. If you've got <laughs> diarrhea of the eye, the same thing's going to happen. You know? I'm not looking at you anymore. Stay real, stay honest. Give him a shot. <laughs> hey, Marg.